Okay, this recording is for the Dixon Public Library. Uh, today, October 20th, 1998, I'm talking with Lucy Vassar at Lucy Vassar's new home uh, just outside of Dixon. Um, well, you were telling me early about uh, family history. you got some family history that goes way back. Well, the Vassars were Huguenots that were thrown out of France, went to England, and then into Virginia in 1643. So uh, they go back quite a ways. Mm -hmm. They were frontiersmen that uh, when civilization caught up to them, why they went further out. There were two Vassars with Lewis and Clark, and there was a Vassar that came over with Lafayette so that we helped establish the frontiers. Then my maiden name was Good Enough, and they came into Boston three years after the Vassars came into Virginia. But they were, some of them are still there in the stone houses that they, their ancestors originally built so that they've, uh, they're well established. One of my favorite stories is they have formed an organization called the, the Good Enough Family, and they have a quarterly newsletter that they put out called Good Enough Ghosts. And they tell stories that people write in and family histories and different things. Well, what they had their first organization meeting was in 17, I mean, 19, <laughs> 1986, so we, and going into Boston, the day before, flying into Boston, the day before the 4th of July is more than, than your little heart can stand. It is just so exciting. Mm -hmm. But we, we toured all the, we had a picnic at an uh, old Good Enough Farm, which is now an Audubon Bird Sanctuary. We had dinner at Longfellow's Wayside Inn and, and went to Plymouth and, and all of these things. Well, up out of Sudbury, there's a little Mary Goodenough that uh, was massacred by the Indians in 1670-something. And there's a marker on her grave. So we all had to trudge down the hill and see this. And then a couple of years ago, when the geophysical people were running over our ranch, they were kind of parked in my way, so I stopped and talked with them, and they said, um, I always ask, where are you from, or something, and this one fellow said, Wyoming, and my daughter said, that's no Wyoming accent, I went to school in the east. So then he said, um, Boston, and I said, do you know where Sudbury is? And he said, yes, I grew up in Northboro, which is just, adjoining Sudbury, and I said, did you ever hear of any good enoughs, good enoughs, good nose? He said, yes. He said, my brothers and sister, we used to go down and play in this meadow, and our mother used to make us kneel down and pray over this little Mary Goodenow's grave that you, that was massacred by the, or scalped by the Indians. That was the one you visited. Yes, and he said they had never known anybody connected with her, and he was so excited about it, he called his sister <laughs> back in Massachusetts to let her know that there is a family. Hmm. And I thought, here's this Italian immigrant family that has been praying over our little Mary's grave. So I just think that's a wonderful story. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> kind so, of so, so, the, so the good enough, oh, that's right on track. We're, we're talking family history now. The good enough and the, and the Vassars. Now, you said they moved west. Uh, well, the, the Vassars, as I said, were with Lewis and Clark, and they just kind of, they came out um, to Indian territory, married some Indian women, and just kind of uh, worked their way to the Middle West. The good enoughs were, uh, one of them went down to uh, Kansas and started an agricultural college, which is now K-State, and there's a, a good now hall and such. So, but the, 
Some of them came down into Iowa. My great-grandfather started the first dairy in Des Moines, Iowa. And I was born in Des Moines and uh, moved to California when I was a little over a year old. So I'm not a native daughter, but... Uh, Why was the family move made to California? Well, I, I, that I'm not really sure. My, uh, my father was originally in Des Moines, was a um, streetcar conductor. Hmm. And I just think he thought maybe there were better things to do in California. So he came out and he became a Methodist minister here. Now, he came out during the Depression? Yes. Uh -huh. Did uh, that have something to do with the move? I... That could have been, yes. Uh -huh. I was, t in fact, today's my birthday. I was born in 1924. 24? Yeah. Uh -huh. So um, we came out. Um, oh, you must have came out in 25 20, then. Oh. Or 26, maybe. Uh -huh. Yeah, a little and before the Depression. Yeah, yeah, before the... Those were some hard times for farmers, the oh, late 20s. Oh, I ate a lot, <laughs> a lot of peanut butter. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> now, let's see, now your father, he was, you said he was a, a, a minister, a yes. Methodist minister. Yes, well, we came to, to California. His brother was in Lincoln and was a jeweler in Lincoln, and we stayed there for a while, and then uh, he decided, I guess he's... He got the calling, or whatever you call it, and uh, became a minister, and we settled here in California. Now you settled in Lincoln. No, we, um, his first parish was up in Cedarville, up in Modoc County. Mm -hmm. And then we came down to Farmington in San Joaquin County, Brentwood in Contra Costa County, Meridian, I guess that's in Butte County, uh, Edna up in Siskiyou County, so I've lived around California. Hmm. I went to, ended up going to school at Davis when there were 176 girls. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of historical too. <laughs> it's a far cry. Now you went to school in Davis. Now I got a feeling somehow or other that's how you got to Dick. <laughs> yes, I. Um, my husband Irvin Vassar was going to school there too, and we had uh, trigonometry and psychology together. So we became friends, and and then the war came along, and uh, the Signal Corps took over the campus, and he joined the Air Force and. I went to school in San Jose, and then we got married, and then we came to Dixon. You said the Signal Corps took over the campus. Yes. I never heard you about that. You haven't heard of that story? No, tell me about that. <laughs> well, I don't know. They just had to have a place to go uh -huh. to take, and so they just closed up Oh, I didn't realize that. The they campus. closed that, up the campus. Oh, let's see. That was in 40, we were married in January of 44. So that was probably in 42, 1942. Hmm. I remember Sadie Peterson told me about uh, being on top of grain silos watching airplanes through binoculars. <laughs> yeah, well that, uh, I just danced with, we went to the USO and danced with everybody. Oh. <laughs> so I danced my way through the war. Mm -hmm. While your husband was in the Air Force. Well, or he wasn't your husband then, was he? No, he was my husband. I mean, after, um, after we were married, I... But my folks were in uh, Redwood City, uh -huh. and my dad was with the Red Cross, and so I stayed with them until. Mm -hmm. But my husband uh, was always interested in livestock, mm -hmm. and he, when he was in high school, he used to show at the fairs, and it put him through, through college. He, um, you mean he showed at the fairs? He right? showed livestock at the fairs. So he, he won money for doing Oh, that? yes, you win oh. money. <laughs> <laughs> and more than just a blue ribbon, you get money. You get money, yes. Uh -huh. And in those days, it was easier. Um, he used to, 
get all different breeds of chickens. And the fair would take care of the chickens during the fair, but he'd get the, the premium money for the chickens, and that would pay his expenses. And then the money that he earned from the sheep was profit. Mm. And he used to show for the camel ranch, Nancy and Bill Camel, which are south of Dixon. Mm -hmm. They were our mentors. They were wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, I was afraid you were going to start telling me about raising camels in Dixon. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, but you say they were your mentors. So yes. You, you learned a thing or two from them. Oh. Mm -hmm. Bill could make water run uphill, my husband said, and he helped develop all of this clover land out here. Mm -hmm. And um, then they were the ones that got us, he found the place that he thought, because my husband had a little 20 acre ranch north of Davis, between Davis and Woodland, and um, we lived there until moving to Dixon. Now your husband's family, they were involved in ranching already? Well, they came from Hopland. Do you know where Hopland is? Yeah, I do. That's in Mendocino or is yes, that Yes, in, in Mendocino, Mendocino County, mm -hmm. yes. And they were great growers. Mm. And um, my husband's father, who I never knew, was a sheep shearer. And so it, it kind of went, they, all the people over there had sheep or were had some connection with sheep because that was a good cash crop, mm -hmm. the wool. and uh, So he used to show for camels and for different people. He used to take carloads of rams to San Angelo, Texas. Have you ever taken nine carloads of rams to San Angelo, Texas? I never have done that. It's an experience. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, now, Carlo, you're talking about railroad cars. Freight cars, cars. Uh -huh, yes. Of course. Yeah. And uh, then there are other fun stories you listen to. We used to show at uh, Ogden at the Golden Spike show and then go back to Chicago to the international show. And we'd have young fellows work for us, and they would ride the boxcar to Chicago in December, which... Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> There's a whole another book on that, those stories. Well, now, the, so <clears throat> your mentors were the, were the camels, and you, and you learned a lot about the sheep business, and then you, you went off into your own. Yes, suppose, yes. You know? we, uh, we leveled a piece of land out in the Reclamation District and uh, started out uh, a few sheep, and we showed sheep, and... Uh, we just kind of expanded and we bought um, some land out in the bypass. Howard Vaughn was another big sheepman mm -hmm. and um, he had the knowledge of putting things together and he was partners with about five different people and um, we learned a lot from him too and when he passed away why we went into partners with Mrs. Vaughn for a while and then um, bought out a nephew and expanded. And then we were down, oh, I guess before that, we um, down about halfway to Rio Vista in Peter's Pocket. We bought, we leased it for a while and then we... Um, so you were in the Peterson Estate neighborhood? Well, in that neighborhood, it's a little bit north oh. of that, but it's in the slough area. The, they built levees up around the place to reclaim it from swampland. Mm -hmm. And there's interesting stories on how it cost $30 a day to put up this levee, where now it would be buku's more. But um, we pumped water out of the sloughs and over the land and pumped it out the backside and the tide brought it back to us. Hmm. So, and the land was heavy adobe land, which was wonderful for the clover crops. Hmm. So we um, 
had sheep. And, and at one time, we, um, oh, then we bought some more land across the school, and you kind of expand, you don't. A lot of farmers never invest in, in anything but land. The bankers wondered why we, why we did things that way, but that's... Why, why do they invest in land? Well, you take care of the land, and the land will take care of you. Mm. It's kind of the... And there's a pride in ownership of land, mm -hmm. and developing it, and uh, making it produce. Well, it makes sense to me. Why, why would a banker not understand that? Oh, well, they... Uh, some bankers are funny. <laughs> I, I won't go into that either. <laughs> I've had my ups and downs with bankers. Mm -hmm. But um, we've, we've managed to stay on top of things. So. Well, tell me about uh, kind of the, the details of sheep ranching. Something I wanted to ask you about was, was about these boxcars that went to Chicago and you had people riding with the sheep. Were, were they Basque by any chance? No. I keep hearing about the Basque. Oh, well, the Basque people were herders of uh -huh. large flocks of sheep. Uh-huh. And there's still, um, I have a lot of good Basque friends. Oh, you do? And they're, oh, they're fun. Mm -hmm. And, um, but these, the sheep that went to Chicago were purebred show sheep. And so they were smaller flocks than the big commercial flocks that the Basque people uh, work for. Mm. It's, it's two different um, oh, parts of the sheep business. I mean, the purebred people raise rams to sell to the commercial people to crossbreed with their white face ewes. So, um, so the Vassar Ranch covered both parts of the business? Then? Well. We have it at different times, yes. And then at one time, when we had everything in Clover, we um, had a contract to fatten out um, market lambs. And at one time, one day, we had 24,846 lambs on the ranch, which was the highest number we ever had at one time. Hmm. But uh, we... We had bass herders and um, irrigators. We've what about the shearers? Now the shearers and the shearers. Um, they come in. Is it just once a year? Well, we used to shear twice a year, but we're down to once a year now. Uh -huh. And um, one time we bought oh some sheep from some ewes from Texas. And uh, we put the, the wool out for bid, and one fellow bid a dollar and a quarter, and another fellow bid a dollar a quarter and, and a half <laughs> cent. So, uh, I mean, wool was very important in the um, scheme of things. Mm -hmm. So, you mentioned the railroad. I guess. Uh well, who is it? Somebody told me that, gee, nowadays a train doesn't even blow the whistle when it comes through town. <laughs> <laughs> but it used to stop several times oh, a day. Yeah. After, oh, yes. And we used to load, there were, we used to load right down there uh, in the middle of town. There were corrals. And then there were wool warehouses along the railroad tracks that people would bring their wool in to and store. Mm -hmm. And then the wool buyers would come through and sample the wool and then ship it off on freight cars. Well, another part of the business is uh, is the meat, the, the slaughterhouses of, of Dixon. You said there were, there were two. Yes. Uh, well, Mace was the big one. Mace. Now that became armor later it on. It became armor. Uh -huh. And uh, they, they worked well with this area, and we have a lot to thank. But we used to call him Uncle Bruce just because he bought all of our lambs, and we liked him. Uncle Bruce from 
Oh, the mace. Bruce mace, Bruce yes. Mace. So, uh, that. I spoke with, with Letty Mace. Oh. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, you said uh, t this town was called Lamb Town. Well, it didn't get. That called. was an official name. It was no, just no. Just a nickname. And it, yeah, and it didn't get that until oh, the past 10 years. Oh. Because the Chamber of Commerce decided we need to have a festival of some sort. And um, since lamb was our big, or one of the big products, I mean, tomatoes and corn are others, but um, they decided to call it Lamb Town. Well, I imagine that was something from way back in the past. No, 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 something no. It, oh. <laughs> I had the, the pleasure of being the National Wool Growers Auxiliary President. Oh. So I got to travel all over the United States. And then at that time, the, the Department of Agriculture wanted to kind of do some, some goodwill with foreign countries. So I got to travel abroad uh, on numerous trips. And we always had to say where we were from and such. And I said, well, I was from Landown. In Dixon. So then the group that I traveled with started calling me Lambtown Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but we, we helped put Dixon on the map. Well, um, now before, you mentioned your husband uh, uh, winning a lot of money at, uh, at various fairs with his chickens and his, his sheep. Uh, I suppose he, he won a few things here at the Mayfair in Dixon? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. And I've always said that showing is, is like gambling or, or alcohol. It gets in your blood. Oh, really? Because our children work their way through school showing sheep and cattle. Hmm. We had a sheep disease, and all of our sheep had to be slaughtered so that we went into the cattle business, too. So... Um, that our kids grew up in the fairs. We never went on vacations. You but went to fairs. We went to fairs. Mm -hmm. hmm. Oh, your children. Now, were your children, were they part of uh, Future Farmers of America? And yeah. Uh -huh. They, um, well, actually, my oldest son, Bob, played football. So he was not in, um, and he went on to Colorado State and then back. Cal Poly, and he went into international agriculture and was in Iran in the days of the Shah, and then went to Indonesia and Liberia. So he had an interesting agriculture. My daughter, Anne, went to school. She wanted to get away, far away from home as she could, and she went to uh, Washington College in Chestertown, Maryland for a couple of years and then came back to Polly. And she was an ag teacher. And then when her dad died, she was the logical one to come home and run the ranch. My youngest son, he wanted to get further away from home, so he went to Cornell <laughs> and then back to Berkeley. <laughs> and then he was a market news reporter on the state. In so all of them moved away from home, but they never really moved away from agriculture. No. No. Always somehow related. Oh, yes. It? They just, they knew if they went to Davis, their dad had to have them home working every weekend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and sometimes at night. So that's it. Mm. Uh, let's see, what do we got to talk about? Well, tell me uh, about the fair. I know Sadie, she was one of the judges uh, out mm -hmm. there. Well, fairs. Are they all the same? <laughs> no, no, they're not. <laughs> they. Uh, what about the Dixon Fair, though? What's so special about it? Well, Dixon? it's it's one of the oldest, or in fact, the oldest fair. Is that right? In the state, mm -hmm. they started out uh, by having it was always on the first of May, mm -hmm. and there's one story of some teacher that taught all these little kids or little girls the maypole dance, and so they'd put on the maypole dance at uh, the Mayfair, and then there were horse races, buggy races, and um, quarter horse races, I guess they were, 
But mm -hmm. that was, and everybody would take their picnic lunch down to the fairgrounds. They didn't have booths of food like we have now, but they, it was just a, just a May Day picnic. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, and of course, there was the May Day parade. And a parade. Mm -hmm. And they always had a queen. Mm -hmm. um, I better not go into who used to be queen because I can't remember. <laughs> but I've seen a list of, of the different local girls. It I was met, I met a queen a, uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, McGrew, uh, Ken McGrew's oh, wife. Oh, yes, uh, yes, uh, Barbara. Barbara, uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she was the queen. Uh, what about the other parade, uh, the Holy Ghost Parade? Well... And they had a fair as well, didn't they? Well, it was kind of a... I don't know, but they served good food. It's all I can remember. I've never... When we came to Dixon, they had the Holy Ghost Festivals. And they'd have a parade. And then they... I think it was the Portuguese mm -hmm. people. And... They had this soup, I think it was called. Oh, God, it was good. You had this beef with this sauce and French bread. And it was wonderful. But I don't really, I don't know much about it. Mm -hmm. Except I used to go, because everybody went. Well, that was, that was Portuguese. Uh, I always hear about the big groups... Uh, well, there were ethnic, Germans. Germans and Portuguese are the big two. Uh, the, yeah. yeah. When, and just listening to the stories at the historical meetings, it's the old German families. Mm -hmm. um, the Royers, the Timms, Schultzes. The Schroders. Schroders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're some of the earliest settlers here. Yeah. 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 Have you seen the journals that the historical society Yes, I have. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. You've... That's pretty good. Uh, I mean, it's a pretty good journal you got out there. Well, Olin Tim was the was the driving force mm -hmm. behind that. He had wonderful stories, and uh, he he used to go. He and his wife used to go to. I think it was fourth grade in school every week and tell the stories of Dixon, the early history of Dixon, so that the local kids, the newcomers, could learn about their town. Mm -hmm. And then Olin, being a sheepman, would take pregnant ewes to school so that the kids could see a lamb being born. And he'd, he'd take them in the morning and hope that they lamb that day. <laughs> and then he'd take them home at night because in town it's Town dogs can just um, play havoc with um, mm -hmm. sheep if they're inclined to do so. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a good thing we've got the Dixon Historical Society. They're sort of carrying on that sort of work in different ways. Yeah. Uh, even this project right now. Is yes, well now this project is thanks to Oh gosh, I can't remember their name right now. I can't either, and I was just talking about them yesterday. The, the husband of one of the daughters ended up being a general in Washington, which I think is kind of fun. We, Dixon hasn't produced a lot of generals. And uh, they gave this money for this study, mm -hmm. historical. And I guess they were quite... Uh, I think when you live in Washington, you get kind of steeped in the history, just being there. Mm -hmm. A lot of other things go on. <laughs> but if you're inclined to be interested in history, it'll really get you. I know. I, I spent a week in, in Washington and most of the time in, in the Smithsonian and, and other museums. Oh, just a second. There we go. But... Uh, well, you mentioned some, some businesses. Now, we should talk about some businesses. Now, you, you're you a newcomer. You've only been here 50 years. But right. uh, 50 years ago, what, what did downtown look like? What were some of the businesses there? Well, the population, I think, was like 2,400 when we came here. And now it's 14,441. Hmm. So we've come a long way, baby. Dawson's has been on the corner of... 
first and A Street since I don't know, I mean, since before my time. Now, they didn't move across the street, though, didn't they? Someone told me they were on the other side of the street. Well, they may have been, but they probably for 50 my 50 years, years they've yeah. been on that corner. Yeah. On the corner where Bud's is now was um, the Chinese restaurant. Hmm. Um, gosh, I can't remember what it was. But Olin tells the story of when he used to go on land buying trips and he needed cash, he'd go in there and the, what's his name? Chinese. He'd go down to the basement and he'd keep his cash in a sack of potatoes. And so <laughs> he'd get Olin and write him a check and he would give Olin cash to go on his trip. So it, it served several purposes. <laughs> Then uh, there was a service station where the empty lot is now. Now was that uh, Todd Thompson's shell Ty station? Thompson's shell station. Mm -hmm. Then on the other corner there was a five and ten cent store, and that was there for years. Up the street was the Betty Ann shop, which was a little dress shop owned by Mrs. Leathers. Then Hans Royer had his insurance in one of the buildings. Um, there was a theater. Oh, and then there was a Shell, um, Chevrolet garage. Hmm. Um, and then there was the old Bank of America building. Um, it was on the corner where the Bank of America parking lot is now. That's where I was introduced to Richard Nixon when he was running for office. I didn't know. Richard Nixon visited Dixon? Yes. Running for president? Or Senator. For Senator. Uh -huh. And Howard Vaughn introduced me to him on the steps of the Bank of America building. Oh, no, he lost that race. Yes, he did. And he said he'd never run again for public office. <laughs> Times have changed. Mm -hmm. Well, now, let's and see. And then the old, um, then, oh, the post office mm -hmm. was on the corner. The post Oh, that's right. Was on the corner. And then opposite the post office was Denton Barker's grocery store. And then was the first, it was the first northern bank to begin, first national bank to begin with. The old bank building, it was a beautiful interior. Hmm. And then there was a barber shop, and then the purity store. And then there was a, just, I mean, there was a hub. No, wait, wait, what's a purity store? It was a grocery store. Oh, that's right. Someone else mentioned the purity store. <laughs> Strange like thing. Safeway, purity. Uh -huh. that's, um, so, and then there was another bar in there. Oh, and a dry goods store. Finks. Finks? Yes. Hmm. But then there were, there's earlier, that's just in my 50 years. I mean, there were, all those establishments were there, mm -hmm. only under other names earlier. Mm -hmm. Artist Riedel has maps of the early town site and who was where. And yeah, she has quite a collection of, <laughs> of, of everything. photographs and yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah that's true. Um, now, being involved in, in agriculture, of course, you, you pay attention to uh, the weather. And you talked about the levees and pumping out the water. Water, water is Floods. California's gold Yeah. as far. Um, but sometimes you get too much and sometimes you have droughts. So. Yes, well down at our pocket ranch, we, which we have just sold within the last year. Because my daughter and I, our knees are kind of given out on us. But the levees were put up and in the eight, after the 86, no. After the 68 flood, the U.S. engineers came in and built up the back side of the levee because there was debris on it. And then they had to uh, turn it over to a public identity. So we had to form a reclamation district. And we were the smallest reclamation <laughs> district in the state. But we had levy inspections, and during the floods season, you have to 
um, patrol the levee every so often mm -hmm. to um, watch for boils and things. And um, 78, no, 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 86, we had land on both sides of the levee, but we had a levee break. And um, it, we lost 300 head of sheep on that side of the levee. So it, um, it was kind of a, 86, it was not a good year. Well, I was just going to say, gee, it would seem like sheep could, could get away from a flood. Uh, well, tomatoes, it, tomatoes can't move, but sheep mm, can run off. Well, you? there were even pheasants caught in the fence and oh, drowned. Really? I mean, the water came up hmm. that fast. We had sugar beets over on that side, and they were underwater for, they were beautiful big beets. Just the farmer that did the farming for us was a very good farmer. And when, when the water got off, it was just bare ground. They, the sugar had inverted, and they had just eaten themselves up. And uh, it was just not a good year. <laughs> Uh, let's see, I was talking with uh, May Azevedo, yes. and she mentioned about uh, grain fires, or whole fields would, would burn up. Mm -hmm. Well... That, that doesn't happen with alfalfa, though, does oh, it? No. Oh, no. See, alfalfa is green and it doesn't burn. Yeah, that would never happen. Yeah. But there was, before the Lake Berryessa went in, and the water, see, water is gold in California, Bef this was all dry land farmed in grain. And they were just field after field after field of grain. And then irrigation came in, and it came into row crops. And uh, corn and tomatoes, uh, sugar beets, so that there wasn't as much. But those stories of the, down at, at our pocket ranch, Main Prairie Slough ends there. The Dixon Boat Club is now there. But there was a town called Main Prairie. And in, um, let's see, there was a big flood in, I think it was 1868, that the whole area flooded and Main Prairie uh, washed out. But there were, the barges used to come up from San Francisco and Oakland, and they'd load grain. There were grain warehouses, and there was swinging a swinging bridge over the slough to get. There were three hotels. It was amazing uh, what what was there, and there's pictures and write-ups of like 150 teams of horses or mules ready, lined up to unload at the docks. And to me, a picture of 150 teams of horses loaded with, with their wagons loaded would be a massive hmm. picture. But that all um, flooded out. Mm -hmm. So down there, they Transporting everything by barge, and up here, everything by railroad. Yeah, and then, uh, well, when the railroad came through, why the barge, I mean, it was, it took away the, the water. Oh. That's true. Uh, transportation. Well, what about getting out there to the, the Peter's Pocket and all? That was, what were the road conditions like back when, when you well, first came? Well, when here? we first came, the road was just gravel. And there there was a little organization called the Main Prairie Service Club. And all the farmers belonged. They had their own telephone line. Harry Peterson, I think, was at the end. And he uh, and some of the Nortons and the Browns, they kind of took care of uh, taking care of the, the telephone line. 
but um, the first Main Prairie Service Club meeting that we went to was um, in the old schoolhouse that had been moved up from the town of Main Prairie at one time. And uh, they were trying to get better roads because they were just gravel roads and that. The county road man came and said, you people just driving the same two ruts. He said, you should move over and drive where there's gravel instead of throwing it around. So then it, it gradually got paved uh, down to the boat club and the ranch. I think the boat club helped because there were some influential people in the boat club that said we need a paved road to the harbor. Yeah, I think it was Malcolm Tim he mentioned. Uh, no, it was it was Mel Monk. Mel Monk told me about a guy in the 1960s who had a team of horses to pull a harvester. <laughs> in the 1960s. Now, now you don't remember anybody using. No. It was all mechanized. It was all yeah. mechanized in the 30s. Oh yeah. yeah. And the only stories I've heard about, they had these. They called them Fresno scrapers, and they were pulled by horses or mules to make the levees on uh, mm. the islands. Mm. I think they use those as street building. I think so, yeah. Mm. Oh, you mentioned the telephone and, and uh, Harry Peterson. Uh, how they, I, I guess uh, they had uh, party lines? And oh, yeah. Yeah, you... You cranked it back? You, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've got a couple around here someplace. I, I'm not sure exactly where they are. but. Uh, so the cranking, uh, someone described well, how that works. A couple of cranks means a call to one person, a few more? Well, or you, one crank and you got the operator. Okay. There was a telephone office in town. And if you wanted to find anybody, you just call the operator and you tell her who you're looking for. And she'd say, Oh, I think there's somebody having dinner over there. And now, that she, was Annette Seifer's mother, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> so she knew where everybody was. Yeah. Uh -huh. but the, and then you had different rings, two longs and a short, or two shorts and a long and a, two more oh, shorts or that's something. That's how that worked. That's how. Uh -huh. Now all your neighbors could pick up and listen to your Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. You learned a lot. <laughs> the... Henry Peters, that originally had a ranch, was another very far-sighted man, and he had seven huge ranches. And his son, Elwood, turned out to be kind of a playboy and gambler, and he lost most of them. But uh, he had, it was actually a hunting lodge for duck hunting and pheasants. And... Uh, I talked with his son, Pal, who says he can remember when Clark Gable used to come up and go hunting. Hmm. And there used to be, I've heard stories, of uh, barges come down from Sacramento. Girls would come down from Sacramento. And, oh, there was a gaming room, and there was a regular bar with a brass rail and a rock fireplace. And it was, it was a gentleman's hunting club. And there was one nephew who used to have to stand out by the uh, road. And when any of the wives came down, he had to ring the, pull this chain and it rang a bell to warn the men that the wives were on their way. <laughs> so, um, well, hunting, uh, I ran into uh, Otto Royer. Actually, I met. I ran into him. I met him earlier. I ran into him again at Sadie Peterson's house. Oh. But they were talking about uh, shooting doves. Oh. That's a pretty popular sport out in that, yeah. that section, isn't it? Plenty of doves out there. There's a few doves around here, not uh -huh. a lot, but there's a few. That. Um, doves and pheasants and duck. And duck. Uh -huh. Well, the, I guess. The wildlife down in that area, the Chinese used to come up and just slaughter them and take them to 
San Francisco to market. Mm. I mean, they were just, and then there were Thule elk that came in there, and um, let's see what else. But it was really a big game, and I've read someplace about building the railroad tracks across the Susun Marsh, and they had trouble because it was marshy land. Every now and then the track would just go to nowhere. But it was built a lot for the hunters to come in. Hmm. Because it was a gentleman's sport. Yeah. It's Central Valley is still a, a great <laughs> place for ducks. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. Well, what about electricity? We talked about the telephones, but well, out electricity there, was here when I came. Yeah. So I. That was an early thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to ask about. Well, I, I guess you call them organizations. You mentioned the Maine Prairie Service Club. You mentioned another uh, wool growing association. Well, the wool growers, uh -huh. the California wool growers, is actually the oldest. Uh, commodity organization in California. Hmm. And they, uh, because this was a big sheep producing area, we've had quite a few state and national officers. I think Harry Peterson's dad was the very first. And Harry Peterson was a president. And he was a president. Mm -hmm. Howard Vaughn was both a state and national president. Um, let's see who else. But it's, um, they've been very, because there were so many sheep here, and the people were good businessmen, and were leaders, and they took uh, pride in their, in their business, and so they were promoted. Well, now these. Well, right now you're you're the treasurer of the uh, Dixon Historical <laughs> Society. So you've been a member of a lot of organizations that are are mixed up well, with Dixon. When we first came to Dixon, I was asked to join the the Native Daughters. Well, I'm not a Native Daughter, <laughs> so I said sorry about that. But we had um, a local organization called the Bo Peeps. We were the haven't heard of those. Well, we've kind of slowed down, but we did promotional things. We uh, made special prizes and awards at different fairs, both at here, both at the Mayfair and Solano County Fair at Vallejo, and then the Yolo County Fair. And we have lamb tastings at State Fair, and um, we had a a wool promotion called Make It Yourself with Wool, where uh, girls could enter and uh, they'd be judged. We used to have, I was director of this area, District 7, and we used to have 125 contestants of girls that had made, and every now and then there'd be a boy that uh, made their garments, and then they went on to a state competition and then went on to a national competition. Hmm. And uh, that was one big promotion that we did for our industry. Mm -hmm. But you've done things to promote the town as well. Oh, well. <laughs> and <laughs> some social, you? social, do, do, you, do you play uh, bridge? Like no, I never no. played. There was a few of us in my younger days that never played bridge and so we'd get invited to these bridge clubs and we'd play Scrabble. <laughs> it's quite a thing to get some bridge, isn't it? Oh, yes. <laughs> the, Mrs. Vaughn <laughs> used to belong to a couple of bridge clubs and she'd say she was just exhausted. She'd play bridge all day. <laughs> but I was always more involved in 4-H. Oh. And I taught um, sewing, so uh, I I did other things, and then I was always the gopher for the ranch to go get parts and and things to keep keep the ranch running. Mm -hmm. 
in the bookkeeper room. Hmm. Well, let's see. I think I've talked about everything on my list. Um, what else should we talk about? Well, let's see. What, we must have missed something. <laughs> yes. Well, Dixon is really a neat little town because it does have history. And it's interesting that the, the new people that come in, they, they want to change it a little bit. Some of them are more radical than others, but they, uh, with the coming election, why there's always a few newcomers that want to uh, make it like someplace else. And Dixon shouldn't be made like someplace else. It's Dixon. It's still a small, agriculture, or we hope, but I'm afraid it won't stay a small agriculture community, but um, there's a lot of ties of people who have lived here and uh, grown up here and moved away, but then keep their, their interest in Dixon, which is mm -hmm. good. But we need more members for the Historical Society because they're dying off. <laughs> we have to keep it going so we can someday get a museum. A museum would be awfully nice. Yes. Yeah. Well, at least we've got this oral history project, which I think is a pretty nice thing uh, for, for the younger and the newer members of, of Dixon to, to see and to hear about what Dixon was once like. It'll be interesting what the library does with these tapes, whether they will take them to the schools and have a history, special history class or a special. I know, actually, when you were just speaking about uh, Olin Tim and how he would go to schools, I, the idea just popped in my head. How about taking all these 30 some odd videotapes and kind of get the best of each one and put them onto one oh, and then bring that around to the school? Oh, I think that would. That be would be a, a good little project. A good project. I would go along with that. Mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah, I love oral history and what it, what it does. And you have to get the kids interested. Uh, I mean, Dixon has a Mexican heritage now, and they have fiestas and stuff for Mexico. And this is California. I mean, they're doing it in their own way to to keep their culture alive. And we're kind of falling down on it, I think, sometimes. Well, maybe it'll blend in, just like the Portuguese. It yeah. Kind of blended in. Yeah. yeah. OK. Well, I guess this is a good place to stop. Is that a good to place stop. to stop? Yeah. Oh, well, that's been interesting. It's been fun. So thank you very much for uh, taking a little time uh, to do this. And we will get to see it. You'll get to see it, uh, I hope, soon. Well, they, um, they said the March meeting for the Historical Society was going to be some of these oral histories, so it'll be interesting to see. You going, You have your work cut out for you. <laughs> oh, it'll be done by March. I'm sure of it. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks again. Thank you. It's been my pleasure.